Next, I'd like to switch gears a little bit, change a different, the tone of what we're about to talk about, to cultural geography, human geography, how we live in our planet, what's happening there. And uh, a couple years ago, Jim Fallows and his wife, Deb, were here and talked about a new adventure they were going to take, a new exploration. They have a little airplane, and they decided to fly all over the United States and from the bottom up, write about their experiences. And they've just published a brand new book. They're going to talk about this, which is the human experience in small cities and the revival of what's happening in America, in, in America today. Uh, I forgot to mention that their airplane has a little parachute on it. <laughs> so, come on. Jim is a pilot. His wonderful wife, co-author of this book, are going to talk about their adventures. Jim. Thanks so much, Jack. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. See you. Thank you so much, Jack. It's both an inspiration and a challenge to follow Felix and Tom this afternoon, but we're, Deb and I are just thrilled to, to be here and to tell you our, our story. So... Our presentation, the stories you're going to hear for the next few minutes are a little different in form from most of what you've heard today at the user conference, in that we're going to be talking less about technology and less about um, business and less about some of the other uh, developments you've heard in the last few hours. But instead, we're going to be talking about the surrounding story. And even though there is this difference in form, I think the stories we're about to tell have a direct connection to uh, the, the charge that Jack Dangerman laid out for us at the beginning of the conference today and has run through so many of the presentations. And that is the balance between, it's the imagining what's next balance. On the one hand, what's next in technology has so many accelerating new tools and possibilities and exciting, uh, exciting developments that you all are part of the creation of. What's next for the planet and for many of our societies involves lots of challenges. And so the task of inspiring what's next involves that balance between all of the opportunities and benefits that you all in this room are responsible for creating and the challenges that are there for all of you to address environmentally, socially, politically, and in all other ways. So that is the story we'd like to tell you about that balance. We'd like to leave you feeling inspired that what's next is up to you. And we're going to do it by means of an improbable travel story. One that, in fact, as Jack mentioned, kicked off five years ago at this very event, in this very stage, when we were trying to see what it was like to explore the United States from the small town perspective. And so that's the story we're going to briefly introduce to you. Right, Deb? Right. Right. So this is <laughs> a rare moment hearing, hearing the right. De Deb will tell you her version of the story shortly. All of the presentations you've heard so far involve distillation, sort of tips of the iceberg of much larger possibilities and, and uh, con connotations. We're also going to try to give you a tip of the iceberg of things we've seen and why we think for people in the GIS business, they set an opportunity, a challenge, a wonderful inspiration for all of you. So that's the story. So um, I'll, I'll give you some of the background. So Deb and I are, by background, a magazine and book writers, and we've lived around, around the world. We've been explorers for all of our life. And when we came back uh, from China a number of years ago, we decided it was time to apply our exploration to our own country, the United States. And what you see in front of you is how we did it, our little Cirrus airplane. Um, those of you who know flying will know, as Jack mentioned, that this plane is famous as being the one with a built-in parachute. Fortunately, we've never used this, but uh, the, everybody who has used it in the plane's history has survived. Those of you who know physics will understand that this is a small airplane, so what you see in this picture is everything we took with us, all the plane would hold for about a six-month uh, six travel stint. Also, you can see it was a cold day outside Washington when this picture was taken. That's why there's an electric core to warm up the entire plane. So we began our exploration of going around the country using tools you are familiar with, your own GIS-style tools to, under to try to decide places we would visit, stories we would explore, challenges we would see at, at the local level. We tried to find places not divided by state lines, but by similar environmental or business or other challenges uh, they had faced. 
And this was the pattern of our travels over the last uh, five years, which I'll have this animation show. It will light up uh, sort of year by year. And in political terms, our travels went from early 2013 through the beginning of 2017, which meant in the U.S. calendar, that was the time from when Barack Obama began his second term to when Donald Trump was about to begin his, his term. But interestingly and significantly, we didn't do any of this exploration asking about national politics. Instead, we asked people, what was the story of Sioux Falls, South Dakota? What was the story of San Bernardino, uh, California? What was the story of Fresno? You'll see from the map, we've gone, been all over the country in a process that's not scientific, but we think is representative. Places as far northeast as Eastport, Maine, as far southwest as Ajo, Arizona. And we took from this something that we had not expected, and it's the main message of our book, and it's the main thing we want to try to convey to you right now. So my experience with speeches or presentations of any sort is that people can remember a day or two later, a week or two later, at most one point. I hope you remember everything Deb tells you, which she'll do soon, but here's the one point I would like you to, rem to uh, recall from what I'm saying, if possible, which is in most developed societies, the United States and much of Europe, there's a tremendous struggle going on right now between the paralysis and division of national level politics and the creativity and the progress and the innovation and the positive spirit at much of the local level, regional level, and state level, as you've heard about today in these presentations. And we saw that, uh, that tension underway in the United States. We believe the message for all of you to apply in your work is to highlight these positive innovations you're developing at the local level and have them to the greatest extent possible offset the tensions, the paralysis, the, some, even the despair that's the case of, of nation, national politics. So we think there's large-scale experimentation around the country and the world, you are part of it, and we all rely on you. I'll just give you three or four quick illustrations of what we saw before turning this over to, to Deb. One of the most interesting trends we came across was the shift in the economic landscape. We're familiar with this around the world, the change from heavy manufacturing to, uh, to service sector work. This map shows, you can see traditionally the manufacturing zones of the country are still there in the, in the blue areas. We saw that any kind of, of ec era of economic dislocation like ours involves people who are dislocated, who are left behind. And so we went to a number of places where there was uh, economic hardship. This chart shows you in red places with uh, more communities uh, who, that are suffering economically and the, the lighter ones, the ones doing better. Interestingly, and of course for GIS, this became, you could see evident patterns at the city level too. For example, Greenville, South Carolina, where we spent a lot of time, you can see some of the patterns of opportunity and being held back. Erie, Pennsylvania, another traditional manufacturing center which is beginning to, to recover. And San Bernardino, California, which is right next, of course, to Redlands, headquarters of Esri and my hometown. You can see the way a, a city is struggling to regain its, its footing. Of the challenges um, we, we saw, we argued that the worst domestic challenge for the United States right now is the opioid epidemic, which you've heard about today, and the ways in which it's taking a human, economic, and public health toll. The fascinating thing about this uh, map from Esri is showing you the concentration of opioid deaths. So you do see that Appalachia, areas of the dislocated white working class is a lot of the center of it, but there are other places too. Also, you can see significantly a challenge between where the epidemic is hitting most seriously and where some of the remedial efforts are being directed. This, for example, is uh, places where it's easy to uh, obtain some of the uh, replacement drugs. You can see there's some mismatch with Appalachia, and here is another place where people can drop off their prescriptions to avoid the opioid challenge. One other uh, map before I, well, two others quickly before I turn the stage to Deb. Something that impressed us greatly was an aspect of the American educational system which was newly revealed in its importance. Most people here, I assume, have been to institutions of 
advanced higher learning, this sort of commanding heights research universities of the United States and of, of Europe. You see those here in the blue. You see them concentrated in the Northeast and on the West Coast. This is America's traditional strength. We were newly impressed with the role that community college, colleges are playing in connecting people uh, who have lost some of the opportunities of yesteryear's economy with the new technological uh, opportunities that are, that are opening up. And so you see them, these are actually in a different geographical pattern from those of the established research universities closer to where people are looking for new opportunities. One more map from me before turning it to Deb. In a way, this is the most significant thing we saw. The, this is a map over the past few years of where refugees have been resettled in the United States. Something that is really striking traveling through the interior is how many places you wouldn't naturally expect, like Sioux Falls, South Dakota, or Fresno, California, or Burlington, Vermont, or the cities of, of many of Minnesota, have specialized in absorbing immigrants over the past uh, generation or so, and have become quite good at it. And we found opportunities, illustrations all over the country of refugees and immigrants as being the vitality of local economies. What you'll notice is how, with the slide for 2017, this has fallen dramatically off the past levels. Through most of modern, uh, modern recorded history, the United States, as the, most, as the largest population developed economy, has received more refugees than other developed economies combined. Uh, that is not the case uh, last year or this year, and we saw evidence of, of that change. So those are some of the, just a sort of quick view of some of the trends we saw. Deb's going to tell you a couple of stories, and then I'll end up with a story that I hope you all will be involved in. Deb. Thank you, Jim. I would like to tell you a couple of stories about a, a few of our favorite towns that we visited during our travels, and I hope they give you a sense of the local level renewal that we've seen across the country. The first is Greenville, South Carolina. Cheers for Greenville out there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is a truly charming city, and the biggest surprise is how different it was only 25 years ago. Back then, nearly all of its economy was based on the textile trade. Today, practically none of it is. Greenville, like many towns, is fought to transition from one industrial base to another. Back then also, the downtown was deserted and even derelict. We heard at least a thousand times about the decline of the, of the old Grand Poinsett Hotel, named after whom was named the Poinsettia, into a haven for drug dealers, and they called it a crack hotel back then. Back then as well, the dramatic natural feature of the town, the falls of the Reedy River, were surrounded by tangles of weeds and were obscured by, by a freeway overpass. But today, Greenville's downtown is an urban success story with walkable public spaces and a mix of retail and office and residential space and public art. And the Poinsett Hotel is again a showpiece on Main Street. Economically, the town has pivoted from its industrial heritage of the now vanished textile mills to the advanced manufacturing plants for BMW and Michelin and GE and many others. And the public school system is a model of the ingenuity and innovation in the arts and in STEM, and they're a poster child for public-private partnerships. My personal favorite in Greenville is the A.J. Wittenberg Elementary School of Engineering. I'm going to say that again. The Wittenberg Elementary School of Engineering, where engineers from the big companies help shape the curriculum and volunteer to teach the little kids from the most challenged neighborhoods in Greenville. And the falls, they were liberated to see the light of day when the overpass was removed and the freeway was redirected. And today the falls are a prime spot for photo ops, for wedding photos and a highlight on the Swamp Rabbit walking trail. Greenville was one of the first cities in America to embrace GIS, and that has helped drive the city's success in downtown revival and city services and recreation and all the other things. 
A second favorite town of ours is Erie, Pennsylvania, much newer, earlier along its road to success. In its heyday, Erie was a classic upper Midwest manufacturing center, but its long, slow industrial decline set in, and it's symbolized by the, the demise of its massive GE locomotive plant, which once employed more than 10,000 people. Erie's school funding problems became so severe that they proposed closing the public high schools altogether. And the once historic waterfront was described to me by the county commissioner as a place of feral cats, rats, and sludge. But at just that time, in just these circumstances, a group of Erie residents dared to rewrite their down-and-out story into one of local resilience and renewal. Leadership was critical from the older generation came the business titans, including an age-defying CEO who's in his 80s. And from the younger generation, came a dynamic 33-year-old who had arrived 20 years earlier as a refugee from Kosovo to Erie. Now he's a PhD and directs a research and public lecture foundation there. Erie's new industrial base includes advanced tech products, and a classic old office building now houses shared workspace for digital entrepreneurship in the arts and in publishing. The waterfront has a new public library, a nautical museum, a convention center, and lots of hotels. And Jim's favorite, multiple craft breweries, have sprung up, a sure sign of success. As for signs of inclusion, 10% of Erie's population are the refugees who bring new cultures and language and businesses and grit to the city. Here you see one of the newest arrivals a two-year-old refugee from Syria named Yahya, who is... <laughs> he, his, he always makes me cry a little. <laughs> his shirt says, live to skate. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot more stories like this, but I'm going, to be, uh, I'm going to just leave you with one sort of one charge to the audience. You may be thinking there are some differences between Deb and me on the one hand and, say, Felix, who you were hearing from a minute ago, uh, couple differences of a couple of generations, of nationality, of, of all the rest. But there's a similar charge, a similar inspiration we want to give to you. He is saying, let's plant a trillion trees. We are saying, let's inspire what's next by thinking of your place in a particular stage of history. You may be wondering what this chart is, this slide you see at the moment. The NRA is not what you think. The NRA is the Franklin Roosevelt era National Recovery Administration, which was one of the main organizations of American recovery during the, uh, the, the Depression. Any of you who are Philadelphia Eagles fans will be glad to know the Philadelphia Eagles were named after this blue eagle. It's actually true, you, you can look it up. And my point is that, that there are ways in which our time is, is unprecedented at this moment in history, but it also has resonances to other times in history. And I think if we look back to the late 1800s, the early 1900s, the original Gilded Age, we can see many similarities to the challenges you all will meet. Back in those days, there were similar problems, huge extremes of wealth and income inequality the sudden rise of new technology, and the sense of unfairness for those suddenly displaced, huge flows of immigrants and refugees. But there was also, in those days, an amazing uh, renaissance of people who thought they were going to be inspired by what was next. These were people who were using the technologies of that era to reform the cities and reform workplaces and protect the environment and establish public libraries and do all the things which make us think of the progressive era as a time to look back on for, for illumination. That is the duty we hope that you all will feel now, that to use the places you have at local and state level um, uh, offices in the United States and around the world to see yourselves as the laboratories of democracy, the laboratories of, of reform, to be the people who are inspiring the rest of us with, with what is, is next. That none of us can do it alone, but we can do it together. The motto of the NRA, you say, is we do our part. We are relying on you and all of us 
to do our part to use your tools to bring on the best in what is next. Thanks very much. Thank you.